Today you get to meet Natalie Johnson. She's a friend of mine in the birth world and we occasionally work together here locally. She's an incredibly knowledgeable and passionate lactation consultant. She's also a past labor and delivery nurse. Natalie does a phenomenal job explaining all the benefits of breastfeeding. You'll hear a wide variety of topics that covers lactation myths, how breast size and nipple variations really don't matter, and exactly how breast milk is the ultimate immune support and nutrition for baby and so much more. You're bound to be inspired and motivated to nurse your baby after this episode. Natalie removes the fears and false assumptions while empowering you to really be excited of what your body is capable of and how you are able to give your baby the best start to life. Join us as we have some inspiring, impactful, and powerful information right now that you won't want to miss. Hey, it's Autumn McLeese, your birth doula and crunchy mama source for choosing healthier, alternative ways of living. Because when you know better, you do better. Join me as we explore topics that might challenge what you know to be true when it comes to health, birth, and beyond. Let me help you think outside the box and empower you with steps to do better. Your best life could be on the other side of this next podcast. So join me now. All right, you all are in for a real treat today because I have a dear sweet friend with me who happens to be the most amazing lactation consultant, and we're going to dive into a little bit of mommy talk here. So if you're a pregnant mama, or if you're a nursing mom, or if you're just a wannabe mom at some point in life, This episode is going to be so perfect for you because we're going to get you all the education you want and need about nursing. And I could not bring on anyone more passionate than my good friend, (laughs) Natalie Johnson herself. So welcome, Natalie. Yay. Thanks, Autumn. I am so, so excited to be here and share my passion with you. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited as well. So let's jump in and hear a little bit about how you grew this passion of yours. Um, how did you even, you know, desire to go into lactation teaching and consulting and now you live or now you have a local um, breastfeeding moms group there where you locally live? You know, how did you grow this passion of yours? That is a really good question. So <laughs> to answer that question, I have to go kind of back to my childhood, believe it or not. My mom was a nurse and she actually, while I was in high school, took on a role of helping hospitals become what's called baby friendly. And baby friendly is a certification that is actually, you can get, hospitals can get all over the world that basically says we are going to commit to helping the breastfeeding relationship for moms and babies. So like when I was born, long time ago, they would put babies in a nursery away from their moms. And I remember going to the hospital and like looking in the window and seeing all the babies lined up in the nursery, (laughs) pacifiers in their mouths, swaddled away from their moms. And so as we have progressed in that world, hospitals have started moving towards what we call baby friendly. And what doing baby friendly means we're like having skin to skin and we're going to promote breastfeeding. Anyways, all of that to say, my mom, her job was helping hospitals to do this, to become baby friendly training. And so I started tagging along. She would take me to different conferences. She would take me on meetings that she had. And I started learning a lot about breastfeeding and a lot about how important breastfeeding really is and how um, much that like initial interactions in the hospital can make a difference. So that was high school. And then I get to college and I actually started working at WIC, Women, Infant and Children, the state level at the breastfeeding promotion. And so then it was another level of like, oh, this is so much fun. I'm learning so much about breastfeeding. I'm help. I'm starting to realize the huge gaps there are in the way that we support women. And I was just a student assistant while I was getting my degree in child development, but I loved working with women in infants, children, in the WIC breastfeeding world. So then I basically, I was playing volleyball in college, so I couldn't become a nurse (laughs) my first time through college. But I knew after working with all the lactation consultants I was working with with WIC that I wanted to become a nurse. And then I wanted to become a lactation consultant. Like that's what I was going to do. I was going to become a nurse and become a labor delivery nurse. And then I was going to help moms with breastfeeding. And so that's what I did. My second degree, I went back after playing college volleyball and getting my first degree in child development, which was amazing. And what I didn't realize at the time, a huge foundation for the work that I do now, because so much of 
breastfeeding is really laying the groundwork for attachment and child development. So it all kind of works together. But after that, I started working for my mom a little bit, helping her with more of her mission and helping hospitals become baby friendly. I then went back to nursing school became a labor and delivery nurse. And during that time, started having babies of my own, started teaching our childbirth classes, our breastfeeding classes, and got my IBCLC. So that means I'm an international board certified lactation consultant, uh, which is kind of the highest level of lactation education that you can get. And uh, it's a certification I've held for six years now, five or six years now. Um, And it allows me to practice lactation basically all over the world, which is super cool. And uh, a lot of times people don't realize that it's a specialty. <laughs> like that this is something you could actually go and learn a lot about. So I like to let people know like this, becoming a lactation consultant was is far more than I'm a mom who's enthusiastic about breastfeeding and I help moms who are enthusiastic about breastfeeding. Right. Yes, that's a huge part of it. Like cheerleading is a huge part of it. But I had to like go to school. I had to... Um, do like a thousand hours of helping moms and babies before I could sit for my board exam. And then I have to recertify every five years and it's a, it's a big endeavor. And so, um, it's really, it's really wonderful when you can find a lactation consultant and you can reach out to that person for help and support because they have a a huge knowledge base, uh, that is far different than you get as a nurse or as a doctor or as another healthcare professional. So anyways, I've been passionate since I was in high school. (laughs) Wow. And amen to that because you really do need a good passion. And like you said, a nurse isn't necessarily enough. You know, I remember my experience in the hospital trying to nurse my first child for the first time. And, you know, it was just so such a struggle. Um, and she didn't quite have all the little tips and tricks that like a lactation consultant can have. So I appreciate that about you. And you talked about how, when you were little and you were looking through the hospital windows at all these infants laying in their little, you know, whatever. <laughs> their little cribs. Their little yes, bassinets. Yes, their little cribs. <laughs> Thank goodness we've like left those times, right? And come into the times that we're in where baby ideally doesn't even leave mom and, you know, gets right. put on mom's chest and stays there. So thank goodness. Right. Um, yes. But I love that about you. And let's kind of dive into... Um, something such as bottle feeding versus nursing. So bottle feeding is obviously so common today. I, me being a birth doula, you know, you and I have worked together. We've talked to a lot of moms Mm -hmm. together, but it's so common for moms to say, oh, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to nurse, you know, just bottle feeding is so much more convenient. Um, I can go back to work or maybe, oh, well, my mom couldn't nurse or, you know, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to, but this whole concept of bottle feeding um, and it being so well accepted, how can you ignite the passion of the listeners on why moms should be nursing? And may I add in, why do you call it the ultimate inoculation? Mm, such good questions. And I feel like, okay, I could, t- I could, how much time do we have? <laughs> I could spend a week <laughs> talking you just about do your thing. how amazing, <laughs> how amazing breastfeeding is. Well, and I think, um, and there's, there's, we have a lot of data now, like you can, you can look at data, you can look at research that says, oh, wow, a breastfed baby has this much difference in IQ and this much, you know, lower risk of this and this. We have a ton of data. And I think at the end of the day, though, what I like to boil it down to is this is how human beings were designed to work. Like formula came in to replace women's breast milk. Uh, It wasn't the initial design. (laughs) That is not how we were designed to function. Like breast milk has been keeping human beings alive for thousands of years. And it is really um, a perfect design. And so once we realize that all of the challenges and struggles and things that seem like, oh, this is weird or this is hard. It's only because of what we do now, not because of that's how it was designed. It wasn't designed to be hard. It wasn't designed to be weird. It wasn't designed to be um, what it is now. (laughs) We look at breastfeeding and go, oh gosh, breastfeeding is so hard. And oh, you have to have all the perfect pillows. And if you don't have the right pump and if you do this and then (laughs) that, but really (laughs) this is how this, we've, we've kept human beings alive for a really long time. And so 
I like to try to get the perspective of like, let's say, let's go back to that data. We say, okay, a breastfed baby has higher IQ than a baby who's being fed formula or a breastfed baby has lower risks of particular health ailments or cancers compared to a baby that's just receiving formula. And we look at breastfeeding and it's like, oh, you can do something like here's the norm and then you can do something better for your baby. But really breastfeeding should be the norm. And what we're, what's happening when we're offering other forms of nutrients is it's lowering what our, our, our baby's abilities, right? Like we're actually, it's, uh, it's worse. <laughs> it's not that this is the norm of formula feeding and we want to breastfeed so because it's better. It's breastfeeding should be the norm. This is what babies need. This is what their bodies need. This is what should be our, like, you know, uh, what, what do I want to call it? Like the, the ideal. And so when we start shifting our mindset from uh, formula feeding is the norm and this breastfeeding things outside the norm, and it might be a little bit different or might be a little bit hard, but you're going to get these really great benefits. And we start saying, well, let's look at that as the norm. Let's look at what breastfeeding is and say that that is the norm. And then here's the alternative that comes with risk, that comes with increased risk of obesity for your child, increased risk of cancer for your child, and changing that conversation, I think, is really, really where we're going and the direction we should be going. And I'm sure there's going to be people who are going to have all the opinions about about this and a lot of emotion can come up and I was formula fed and I was just fine. And yes, that's true. Formula saves babies' lives. I'm not going to say that it doesn't. I'm glad that we have safe formulas. I'm glad that we have water we can mix formulas with. I'm glad for those things, but it's not the ideal food for an infant, the ideal food for an infant is breast milk. You know, the ideal food for a baby cow is its mama's milk. (laughs) The ideal food for a kitten is its mama's milk. And the ideal food for a human being is its mother's milk. And so once we start to shift our perspective of like what we're going to accept as normal and normal expectation, we can start to look at the behaviors of a breastfeeding mom and baby as normal. And when we can do that, uh, all of a sudden breastfeeding is not nearly as challenging. All of a sudden these things that we see as like the hurdles aren't hurdles anymore because we've normalized that and we've created a space where those normal behaviors are expected. And and here's here's a simple example. When you go to the pediatrician and you're there with your three month old baby, they're going to give you a little sheet to fill out about how your baby's doing. How many wet and dirty diapers is your baby having? How many times does your baby eat and how much does your baby take? That is a very easy thing to answer. If you're a formula feeding mom, you can say my feed my baby a bottle every three hours and it's three ounces. And we're in a culture that wants to know that. I have a pediatrician who says, I want to know how many ounces are you feeding your baby? How, how often? Now, if you're a breastfeeding mom, that's a really hard thing to answer. Um, a boob full whenever my baby wants. That's what I would always write, hand right in. A, a boob full whenever my baby wants it. And so then if, I'm, if you're not a confident breastfeeding mom, you can leave that pediatrician visit going, oh gosh, I don't know how much my baby's taking. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're eating like every hour. Is that normal? Is that abnormal? I mean, my doctor said that that seems like a lot because the baby should only eat every three hours. So anyways, all of this to say, I think when we start changing our mindset around breastfeeding, it it can become a lot easier and a lot of those hurdles that we um, see as barriers start to disappear. And when we start to realize like this is the ideal, we can look at all these amazing things that come with breastfeeding and go, this is the optimal, this is the ideal, and I'm going to aim for this, I'm going to shoot for this, I'm going to work really hard. I will tell you that breastfeeding success has a lot more to do with education and support and determination than it does your boobs and your baby. Your boobs want to make milk, your baby wants to eat the milk. And if you have the right education and the right support and the right determination, you can be successful with breastfeeding. Usually it falls apart because of those other things. So um, some of the things that I feel like are really exciting about breastfeeding that would ignite that fire of like, yes, okay, I do think I want to do this. This is interesting to me. I do think I want to change my perspective and lean in. Um, One of the big ones, especially in today's times is talking about immunizations and the what the body is going to get from an immunological standpoint um, for the baby and the mom. So when we talk about this, uh, a baby's born without an immune system. Okay. They are this born is one of my favorite a, topics, by the way. Oh my gosh. 
Oh, yes. I love it. <laughs> oh, this is like, if, if any reason out there why you should breastfeed, like this is top of the list for me. Like this is huge. And I know so many of your moms are going to agree. So carry on. Yes. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. So your baby is born with a uh, sterile gut. And it, it, you may know, I mean, gut health is a very common topic these days, but you may know that like 70 to 80% of your immune system is made in your gut. So like we're talking gut bacteria creating an IgA, which is your immune system response. So when a baby is born, they don't have any microbiome in their gut. They are getting their very first gut implantation of microbiome at the birth process. Moving through the birth canal is their Im first implantation of microbiome that's going to set their body up for an immune, like a strong immune system. So they don't have that yet. So the maternal, the mom's milk is the immune system support for the child. That, that is it. Mom's immunity is what she's giving to her baby when she breastfeeds. Now, what's incredible is that mom in an ideal situation has a strong immune system, right? Hopefully that mom's taking her probiotics. Hopefully that mom's really um, exposing herself to things and she's got a good robust immune system. So her robust immune system when engaging with things in the environment is immediately making antibodies. Those are going through the milk to her baby and her baby is getting this robust immune support from day one from milk from the mom. Now that is not something that a formula can do. I don't care how much you, you know, how wonderful formulas are having an well, if active, anything, alive. If I may add it's yes. the opposite because so much of our formulas now are high fructose corn syrup. I mean, you look at the first couple ingredients, we're giving infants sugar and it's the wrong type of sugar. And we've got genetically modified ingredients in it. So that's far from what God had intended for our infants to thrive and live off of but carry on. Absolutely. Well, and, and we know even in adults who are have consuming large amounts of sugar, it destroys your immune system. Like it destroys your gut bacteria, even as adults. So now we've got this baby who doesn't have a robust immune system and we're not, at, we're not helping. We're not adding anything. And so this, the mom who is nursing her baby. So here's a fun, fun fact. If you are nursing your baby and you're keeping your baby in what we call the habitat close to your body, maybe wearing your baby in a baby carrier frequently and moms who wear their babies and keep their babies close to them frequently kiss their baby's head. And actually the membranes of her lips can help absorb things that her baby's been exposed to. So let's say you're out and about and someone sneezes and that sneeze gets on your baby's head. <laughs> you're likely to kiss your baby's head because you're holding them and you love them and you're snuggling them and they're close to you. And you're going to expose yourself to what it was your baby was exposed to within about an hour and a half. Your body is creating an immune response to that. And it's literally in in your milk at the next feeding. So amazing. as babies, it's amazing. So as babies are growing, you, whatever you're exposed to, immediately the antibodies are going to your baby. Whatever your baby's exposed to, you are also exposing yourself because of the proximity in which we keep our babies close to us and you're increasing your immune response. So here's another fun one. Let's say your baby's six months old and they're crawling around now and they're getting into things. I have a one-year-old. I She's into everything. She's licking everything, right? Always eating food off the ground, always. Now let's say she's licks the bottom of someone's shoe. She exposes herself to some yucky something. And then she comes crawling over and she nurses. Okay. She latches onto my breast and my nipples literally absorb her saliva. There's this process that happens during the breastfeeding relationship where milk is moving from mom to the baby, but the baby's saliva is being absorbed by the mom. My body takes inventory from her saliva, what nutrients is she lacking? What does she need hydration wise? What was she exposed to? And my body makes adjustments, changes the con contents of my milk based on what it is she needs with her from her saliva and immediately starts to make an immune response to what it was she was exposed to. And it's in my milk in an hour and a half. Now I didn't even have to go lick the shoe. <laughs> she <laughs> did. <laughs> and I didn't even have to expose myself, but my body, my robust immune system is supporting her through our breastfeeding relationship. And now what we know is that a child's not actually starting to make their own immune system response for about the first six months. So for six months, your child has no immune system response except yours, what you are giving them, what you are exposing to. So when I talk to moms and they say, oh gosh, I got a cold. And I'm, my husband's trying to keep the baby away so the baby doesn't get the cold, but it's really hard. So I'm pumping my milk and I'm giving it to the baby. But and I'm like, no, 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 no. 
no, 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 no. You nurse your baby. Your baby should be close to you. We, your baby's already been exposed. If you've got a cold, your baby was already exposed. The best thing you can do is to nurse your baby, nurse your baby, nurse your baby, because all the antibodies to that cold that you're fighting right now are in your milk and actively able to give to your baby. It's Let's amazing. talk about these moms and I get it. You know, we don't know what we don't know. That's why you're here to like ignite this passion <laughs> because yeah. we live in such a fearful culture of germs always have. I mean, even 14 years mm-hmm. ago when I had my son, it just, nobody prepares you or no one equips you with all this amazing knowledge of like, Oh no, keep your baby close. And you know, he'll do better when you're nursing him than if he wasn't. But, mm-hmm. um, Talk about like those first six weeks, you know, I'm a birth doula. I have clients that are like, okay, we got to keep the family away for the first six weeks. What does that realistically uh, look like to you? How do you view that first six weeks? And what advice could you pass on to moms that say they want visitors and they're very, very nervous? Does the same thing apply? Oh, great question. So I first want to just talk about that first six weeks. And I I have four kids. Okay. So when you have one kid and you're talking about your first six weeks, sure, there may be the actual ability for you to like hang out at home with your husband, order takeout, not see anyone. Uh, when you have your fourth, I mean, my daughter at four days old was going to school you know, our co-op for homeschool. And we were two weeks headed out on a field trip and we were down in San Diego because my husband had a triathlon and there was no chance my fourth child was not going to be exposed to things. She had three older siblings who were playing with their friends who were exposed to everything under the sun. And we were a family on the go. We were not going to sit at home for six weeks. And guess what, guys? She's just fine. Why? Because I breastfed her. (laughs) And every time someone sneezed, I said, sneeze in my face because I'll make an antibody. And every time someone had a little runny nose, oh, 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 let me help you wipe your nose because I'm going to make those antibodies. And so I think some of this is simply like once again, zooming out and looking at how was this designed? Was this designed thousands of years ago for a mom and a baby to not interact with anyone in the entire community? No, we were designed to live communally. We were designed to be in communion with each other and for a brand new mom to have excessive support, right? If we look at places all over the world and in our history, moms might not leave the house for 40 days, but that's not because she's isolated because she's scared of germs. She's not leaving the house because the community has said, we understand this is a vulnerable time for you. We're going to bring you meals. We're going to clean your house for you. We're going to be here to support you. We're going to hold the baby while you sleep. We're going to do all the things we can for your body to physically heal and for you and your baby to have an amazing breastfeeding relationship. Like those are the priorities. Let's feed this baby. Let's get that breastfeeding relationship established and let's let you heal. That doesn't mean let's isolate you from everyone and keep you because you might get sick. No, no, no. That is not how that works. So now we've taken that as like, oh, well, you maybe should spend 40 days and like really lay low. Yes, but not lay low in isolation because of germs. Lay low because you need to heal your body. And it's hard to heal your body when you're up and you're moving and you're trying to care for a house and you're trying to make meals and all the things. So yeah, I would really encourage, um, I always encourage the moms that I'm talking to that are pregnant that you want to have your first six weeks with excessive support, with the thought that I am going to be healing my body I'm going to be establishing a breastfeeding relationship. And in that, I'm going to need some support. I'm going to need people bringing my meals. I'm going to need people in my space helping me clean. I'm going to need to potentially get out of the house because I might go nuts at home for six weeks by myself. I might need to go sit at a coffee shop and have a conversation with a friend and, you know, have a nice warm cup of coffee with my baby wrapped up close to me. And all of those things are okay to do because you have your nice, strong, robust immune system that is protecting your baby. Um, The other big encouragement I would give is that when we put our babies away from us, we do increase their risk of getting sick. So let's say um, that if I was going to be going out and about with my little one, or when I was out and about with my little one, she was in a carrier. She was right here next to my body on my chest in a carrier. I was nursing her in the carrier. I was, she was, didn't leave the carrier. If she left the carrier, it was because she was in the carrier with my husband. And like, that is where she lived. We didn't put her in a stroller. We didn't put her in a car seat. We didn't have her physically away from us. And there's a big difference, right? There's a big difference. If you go to the grocery store with your three week old baby and they're in the car seat and you take your car seat and you put it in the cart and you're walking around the grocery store with your baby in the cart 
the strangers will do this. And if you haven't had a child, you'll experience this. <gasps> oh, look at your cute baby. And they go right up to your baby. <laughs> oh, and they touch their feet and they touch their hands and they get their face in their face. They, oh, you're a cute little baby. And you have to literally say, oh, please don't do that. Right. Or I've seen people put signs up on their car set, like, please don't touch my baby, please. Now, there's a very different experience when you put your baby in your carrier and your baby's right here against your chest and you're walking through the grocery store, people do not put their face in your baby's face because they'd be putting their face in your face. And that's weird. Right. <laughs> we have personal <laughs> space <laughs> and strangers don't do that to adults. We don't go up to adults and go, hello, and like put our face right in their face. And so you can be protective, so to say to your baby, when you keep them close much easier than you can if they are away from you or in a plastic container or being passed from person to person. Now, is that saying that you can't let people hold your baby? No, but you need to expose yourself to those people. So if your pat, you know, family has come over and everyone's holding the baby, wonderful. But you just need to keep holding the baby, kissing the baby, exposing yourself to those people who are in your space so that your body can make an antibody reaction to whatever it is baby gets exposed to. But then also remembering if baby gets exposed to something that you're not exposed to, you immediately are exposed the minute you latch your baby on. So any exposure your, your baby has, your body creates an immune response to. And you just don't have to be scared. We don't have to be scared of leaving the house or scared of having people over. Um, as long as you are exposing yourself, your baby's going to be just fine because they've got your immune system. I love that. And thank you for that clarification because I feel like some people – you know, maybe they're accepting of what you're saying in that, okay, good. I feel like I have this backup, but I don't want to necessarily go out and purposefully, you know, put my baby in a cart and expose them. So I feel like that's, that's a great um, way to look at it for both types of moms, moms that are like, yep, no, I want my baby to have that robust immune system and other moms that like, no, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll keep, I'll keep baby close. And that should really be a, a podcast by itself, I think, is just baby wearing, because it sounds like you could probably go off on a whole tangent about oh gosh. that. There's so many, so many things I can talk about with baby wearing. Yes, we'll have to do a podcast on baby wearing. A great it's so um, good. <laughs> nursing position for sure, though, at the least, right? Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too, is that we have to remember, like, babies are designed to want to check in very frequently with mom. And so when a mom can have a carrier situation that allows her to easily breastfeed, she is like basically consistently giving her baby not only little bits of nutrients, but little bits of immunity constantly. And so when we are consistently checking in, our baby and our body are consistently checking in with each other. It's just giving our body more and more and more opportunity to create the perfect milk and change the nutrients and change the antibodies and all of these things. Like the more feedback we get from our baby, the more our body can truly adjust and give the perfect, perfect milk to to our babies. And I, I want to say one thing on this, um, this uh, saliva thing, because I know some people think like that just seems crazy, but let me tell you how cool this is. One more fun fact. Okay. So some women do what's called tandem feeding where they have like nursed through a pregnancy and now they have a newborn baby and they have a toddler. Okay. Now let's say your toddler is at daycare or your toddler is playing with other kids or whatever it is. Your toddler is exposed to a whole bunch of stuff. They come home and if they're nursing, right, your body is exposed to what your toddler is exposed to. Your body is creating an immune response and immediately that's going to your newborn. So when we have multiple children, we really can protect our littlest one by the bigger ones exposing us all the time. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of times moms worry about with second and third babies is like, oh, I send my kids to school and my kids get sick all the time. And But you know what they often say at the end of it all is like, well, all of us got sick except the baby. The baby was just fine. <laughs> the baby didn't get sick. The baby had this amazing, you know, roast, immune response from mom protecting it. And so a lot of times babies actually don't get as sick. But the other really interesting thing is, um, and, and most women don't do this, but there are women who have, so I know that this is real and I think it's amazing. If I had, so I've done this, I've tandem fed my babies. Um, if I were to nurse just what my newborn on one boob and my two-year-old on the other boob, my body would absorb newborn saliva on one boob, would absorb toddler saliva on the other boob, and my breasts would literally create different milk for my newborn and my toddler. Wow. Different nutrients, <laughs> different amount. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, um, immune response for both, but the actual nutrients of the milk for the toddler and the nutrients of the milk for the newborn would be different if I just isolated them and nursed them each on their own breast. And I think like that is just this perfect example of how incredibly designed we are to facilitate incredible health for our children that is literally specialized to what they need, what their body mm -hmm. specifically needs. And um, there's just no way you can get that in something that's artificially made. There's just no way. There's no way you're going to get an artificially created substance that's going to change every hour no. to meet your child's needs. You know, it's just, it's, it's incredible what the human body can do. Mm, God's design is so awesome it and gives a really whole new is. meaning to the definition like super mama, right? Or the term super, yeah. super mama, I should say. <laughs> okay. So any other health benefits that you want to add in that you can think before we move on to our last question? Oh gosh. There are so I mean, many I know that's a lot benefits. to ask because there's a whole laundry list, yes. but like just any more <laughs> to rattle off real list. quick. Well, um, I think uh, once again, just, just the perspective of when we can give babies what is ideal for them, we are going to create a child who is as healthy as possible. Now, does that mean that you're going to have a child that's never going to have a health problem? No, that's not what that means. But what it means is that you're giving your child the best possible start you can, and you're giving them the best possible support you can with your milk. Um, so one of the things that I often hear women talk about is they, uh, when it comes to this, like nutrition is like, okay, well, if I don't have the perfect diet, like what if I didn't eat enough avocados today? Is my milk going to be okay for my baby. Like, what if I didn't, what if I ate fast food today? And then I had a glass of wine with dinner and I had a cup of coffee with breakfast and like, should I just give my baby formula? Cause my milk's not going to be good enough for my baby now. And I want to just dispel that myth that, that what you consume is like this direct equivalent to what's going into your milk. It's just not true. Your body is going to create milk that is perfect for your baby based on your baby's saliva. We tell moms eat well, take your supplements, drink a lot of water. That's not because it makes your milk better. That's because your body is literally leaching whatever your baby needs. And if you're not replenishing it, you're not going to feel great. <laughs> you're going to feel tired. You're going to feel like, oh, my body, I just can't keep doing this. This is such a big pull on my body. So we want women to take care of themselves, not because it changes your milk, not because eating an avocado every day is going to make your baby fat. No, that's not a thing. Your baby's going to get the milk that your baby needs. And it may, you might have a chunky baby. You might have a thinner baby. You might have a baby, whatever. Your baby's going to grow to be exactly what your baby needs to be. And your body's going to support that. But what you feed yourself is just to support yourself. And I also want to help moms to let go of this feeling of like, if I'm a breastfeeding mom, I now have to deprive myself. I can't have my coffee in the morning. I can't have my glass of wine with dinner. I can't eat the things that I really love. That's just not true. Have your cup of coffee in the morning. If that's what you want. If you like waking up to having a cup of coffee in the morning, have your cup of coffee in the morning. If you like to have a glass of wine while you're eating your dinner, have a glass of wine while you eat your dinner. Like These are things that we don't have to panic about. If you like eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and you or baby's having a little bit of gas, it's not because of your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> babies always have gas at the beginning because they're building a gut bacteria, a gut microbiome, a byproduct of gut microbiome growth is gas. Babies are going to have gas. Don't deprive yourself because you're worried that like I ate broccoli this one day and my baby had gas. I can't eat broccoli again because you know, whatever. So those connections, I want to just encourage moms, like your body is giving your baby the perfect nutrition. And that nutrition is not based on how perfect your nutrition is. We want you to take care of yourself. Yes. But I will tell you, I drive through fast food sometimes and it's okay. <laughs> I, and you know, it's, it's not a big deal. <laughs> and I bet that's just such a relief for moms to hear right now is because it, breastfeeding seems so new so overly complicated. We have like this scarcity mindset surrounding it because we don't know if we should do this or do that, or, oh my gosh, I did this, you know? And, and then you've got to eat the perfect diet. And it, it almost seems like the way the culture um, portrays it, and I don't even know if it's like one particular person, but we just get this signal that, you know, we need to be so mindful and careful. And just saying, having you say all these things, it gives me just a sigh of relief. It's like, <laughs> I wish I knew you, Natalie, when I had my first, because <laughs> I only gave it about three months. And then I'm like, okay, this is too hard. Like, this is too much. 
And even then I was, you know, I was pumping, um, determined to give him something for his first start of life. But I just love how refreshing it is to hear you toss out so many of these myths and just Mm -hmm. say, just stop overthinking it and just do it. You know, just do it. You can do it. Yes. So like breast milk, for example, changes flavor based on what you're eating. Like your, it actually stimulates the different taste buds in a baby's mouth. So like a baby who's getting formula is getting the same taste. Like I like, the, like mac and cheese, mac and cheese every day for six months of their life, every single meal, mac and cheese, same thing. And breastfed babies are getting this robust diversity of even flavors. So if you are someone who likes spicy food, eat your spicy food. Like don't stop doing that. If you're someone who, and you got to think about this worldwide, like there aren't people in India with all the incredible flavors and spices of Indian food, not eating that because they're breastfeeding. (laughs) No, no, they're eating, (laughs) they're eating their food. And guess what? Your baby gets exposed to the flavors through your milk. Your baby is much more likely to enjoy the same cultural foods your family enjoys if they are breastfed from a mom who's eating those foods. So we actually, this facilitates moving into the culture, moving into the family dynamic, enjoying the cultural food that you're exposed to uh, when you have a breastfed baby who's got exposure to those flavors during their first year of life. So even that, like feeling like, oh, I have to have bland things, or I really can't, shouldn't eat anything spicy, or gosh, shouldn't have sushi, whatever. Not true. Not true. Zoom out. Think of this as a worldwide way to keep children alive. Think about all the other cultures and all the other places women are breastfeeding their babies. And you'll realize like, oh yeah, that really doesn't make any sense. I should just eat what I love to eat. And my child will get exposed to those flavors. And I will have a child hopefully with a robust uh, desire for different flavored foods that they've been exposed to because they didn't just have mac and cheese for six months. They got all sorts of different exposure to their taste buds. So uh, I, yeah, I would absolutely encourage you to enjoy enjoy eating and drinking (laughs) while you're breastfeeding. So one question did come to mind, you know, maybe there's a mom out there that's like, well, my baby has gas. So what is it, Natalie? Like what is causing an issue? I mean, is it the latch? Is it how I'm nursing? Uh, What can I do about this? You know, what, what would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, um, in our support groups, I would say like every single mom that comes through and has a baby from somewhere around six weeks old to like four months, at some point in time is going to ask me about their gassy baby. (laughs) My baby seems so gassy and they like wake up at night and they're grunting and they're kicking their feet and they seem so uncomfortable and I don't know what to do. And I've tried cutting everything out of my diet, but I can't cut anything else out of my diet because I'm only eating lettuce and the baby's so gassy or whatever it might be. So um, as I mentioned before, we know that gas is actually a byproduct of bacterial growth. So if we're looking at the baby's digestive system as this, like sterile environment. If you think of a garden, it's like just soil. (laughs) And now we're planting seeds in the garden and it takes time for those seeds to take root and to start to produce anything, right? To grow, to produce anything. And so if we think of it like a garden, our babies basically are not producing um, their immune system response plants for like the first six months, like they're growing, right? During all of this growth, though, a byproduct of bacterial growth is gas. And we know this as adults. Like if you've ever started a new probiotic and then been a little bit gassy, like that's part of what happens sometimes in our body during this process of changing microbiome in the gut. So every breastfed baby is going to go through a phase of gassiness. And 99% of the time, it has nothing to do with what the mom is eating or how she's latching or anything. It's just part of the process of babies having these blooms of bacteria in their gut and it producing some gas. So usually I will, I will, we'll look at the whole situation, right? We'll look at the latch. We'll like make sure 99% of the time it has nothing to do with the latch. Um, It usually is between that, like one month to four month time span. And I, the, the advice I will usually give is babies often like to have some pressure against their tummy. So wearing a baby where they're kind of tight in a wrap can feel really comforting to them. Keeping their knees up kind of in a, like a fetal position can be really comforting. Sometimes laying a baby on their belly, um, on your arm so that they get a little bit of pressure on their tummy as you're walking and bouncing them can feel good. Little bicycle kicks back and forth with their legs, like helping them move that gas out. But one of the best things to do to help move the gas out is to latch your baby because when a baby latches, they suck and it creates peristalsis in the bowels. So a 
lot of times moms will be like, oh my gosh, I latched my baby. And then they poop every single time we sit down to breastfeed. They poop. Yes. Perfect. Exactly. It's kind of like us chewing gum. Like, have you ever like maybe been really hungry and started chewing gum and then you feel your stomach start to grumble and it's like, it's causing peristalsis. This release of like saliva causes peristalsis. Your body thinks you're eating like, okay, what's coming? So the same thing happens for the baby. The baby knows instinctively, if I've got all this gas and I'm uncomfortable, if I just latch and I suck, I will help this gas move along. I will create peristalsis. So feeding your baby, latching your baby frequently is one of the best things you can do to help that move. Little bicycle kicks, little tummy massage, wearing your baby close, um, but also uh, realizing that it has very little to do with what it is that you're eating. So not panicking about all the food stuff, I think is really important. The one time I will say, maybe there's a connection. If you yourself ate a meal and you yourself were, had a really upset stomach and you were really, really gassy and you felt like, oh gosh, that just did not work well in my body. And you've noticed your baby feeling kind of similar maybe there's a connection. Maybe there's a connection because this baby came from you <laughs> and this baby's microbiome is your microbiome. And like this, this is, so if you struggle, if you have an entire family with dairy intolerance, your baby probably doesn't like dairy much. So, okay. Like if you have a whole family with dairy intolerance and then you eat some ice cream and you have an upset stomach and you notice your baby not feeling great the next day, there's a chance there's an actual correlation there. But the vast majority of babies are gonna have gas. You have to work through it. It's part of the development. And when you know that, you don't panic about it. You just go, oh, we must be in one of these little times when we're getting some good gut bacteria growing. Yay! Let's do extra bicycle kicks. Let's do another, you know, little massage in the tummy. Let's take a nice warm bath. Let me just nurse you more. Um, and you don't panic about what things do I need to cut out of my diet so that my baby doesn't have gas. Mm, I love that. We need every mom, every new mom to listen to this. <laughs> so pass this along, share this episode because, yeah. oh, I just like, I just can't help but think back to my own experience and how comforting that would have been to know that, you know, you feel so, yeah. so alone and it, there doesn't seem to be right. enough lactation consultants to go around necessarily in all areas. So, yeah. so well, good and to what's know. Hard okay. Too, so for just speaking the last, of that, oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one, one of the things that really makes it hard too, is that the marketing that we see as new moms is all from formula companies really working to help Very you true. not breastfeed. So like, you're going to see, the marketing you're going to see is have a gassy baby, try our formula, you know? Oh, things right. aren't going well with breastfeeding, try our formula. Like that is what you're going to see. That's what, oh, you've got a gassy. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must be up all night long with that gassy baby. You really should try something else. It's probably what you're eating, you know? And like that, that is the narrative. So it's no wonder women panic and they think that it's them. <laughs> that's the problem because our culture is still a formula feeding culture and formula companies have mass amounts of money. They market aggressively. Actually, we are one of the only countries that doesn't follow the World Health Organization code for how to market breastfeeding, um, breast milk substitutes. Mm. So there's a, a world, organ the World Health Organization has a code that says these are, this is how you can market a substitute for breast milk. This is how you can market formula and this is how you cannot market formula. Guess what developed country completely ignores those recommendations and completely ignores that code and has not signed off on it. You're right, us here in the US. Mm, not so surprising. all these other developed countries follow these rules where they do not allow formula to aggressively market to women. Here, that's not true. We have aggressive marketing where you're getting formula sent to your doorstep. You're getting emails coming to you saying, oh, your baby's probably getting hungry. Now's a time, to, great time to start some new formula. We aggressively market to women and we aggressively uh, attempt to, the formula companies change that narrative so that women who are breastfeeding, who are experiencing normal things like a gassy baby, who wants to eat every hour think there's something wrong and there's nothing wrong <laughs> it's that you're being marketed at and you're being tried aggressively marketed to to try to get you to change your mind and get you to find the solution that they're trying to give you to your problem which is formula so i think that's a, that's a part of it too is that it's not even just um we have our own insecurities but those are coming from a place of aggressive marketing from a formula company that wants to make money Oh, I'm so glad. Sorry, you tangent. That up. So, so glad. <laughs> and I think about, you know, here we are talking about gassiness. I mean, if anything, if your baby's gassy on a formula, that makes more sense. And rightfully so, because if you know anything about how our formulas are made and the milk industry, I mean, first of all, we've got antibiotics within our, our dairy. And then it's homogenized and or pasteurized. And that breaks down the good 
flora and live organisms that help the milk to be able to digest, you know, properly. And that's essentially what we're giving baby and what a mama cow gives its baby cow. But then we take that and we basically kill it off and it's super hard to digest for us Mm -hmm. humans, let alone a brand new newborn. So just going back to what you said in that, you know, this is not what was made or meant for our our newest little miracle that we just gave birth to. It is not the perfect nutrition. It is greatly Mm -hmm. flawed and we have the perfect nutrition. It's right within Mm -hmm. us. So moving into some of these objections as we close, you know, the objections that I'm too small, I'm too big. I don't have enough milk. I keep getting mastitis. Um, You know, what are some of those answers that you would give to moms if there's a way to kind of wrap it up into one. Um, Is there such a thing or a reason why any of those would be a reason why a mom couldn't nurse her little one? That's a great question. So um, one thing, uh, well, let's start with the like, oh, my boobs just might be too big, too small. My nipples are not the perfect shape or size. Um, I always tell women is, your, your baby is not coming out and wanting everyone to pull down their shirt and saying, let me choose what nipples I think are the perfect nipples for me. <laughs> no, no, your baby wants to nurse and wants to nurse with you. Did you know that your breasts actually emit the same smell as amniotic fluid? So when a baby is born and they're put to your chest, your boobs literally emit the smell of the amniotic fluid that they were living in. So it smells like home. They go, oh, This is where I'm supposed to be. This is my home. And so whether your breasts are A cup, I have tiny A cup breasts and I have been breastfeeding one or two children for the past 10 and a half years straight. Like that is my tiny A cup boobs are just fine. They're making milk just fine. Now my storage capacity is low. And that is, there's a difference between how much you can make and your storage capacity. So I have small breasts, which means I can't go a super long time between nursing without my boobs starting to hurt. (laughs) I'm like, oh, my boob, oh, these hurt. I need to nurse my baby. So my babies nurse very frequently because I have very low storage capacity and we are in a rhythm of my babies nursing frequently and my breasts being able to make milk real frequently, but I can't go a super long time without nursing or my breasts are going to feel really full and they're going to start to hurt. Now, my best friend who also runs my breastfeeding support groups with me, and we've been friends for gosh, eight years now, she has much larger breasts than I do. We make the same amount of milk for our babies, but her storage capacity is more. She can go. We, we went to the spa one day. I had to pump twice because my boobs felt like they were going to hurt so bad. And her boobs didn't hurt until the very, very, very end of the day when we were on our way home. She's like, oh yeah, I'm feeling a little bit Full. But we made the same amount of milk during the day. Our babies were exactly the same age, um, but my storage capacity was less. So having different size breasts makes for a slight difference in your breastfeeding experience, but not a, I can do it or I can't. It's, oh, my storage capacity might be more, which means my baby might get more in a feeding, which means my baby may nurse every two hours. And my storage capacity might be slightly less, which means my baby might get slightly less in the feeding and I might nurse more frequently, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Like when women's bodies, if you grew a baby inside your body, the chances are very, very, very good that your body will continue to grow your baby outside. (laughs) Our bodies don't know there's another choice. Our bodies don't know that we have other options. Our bodies feed the baby with the placenta and expect to feed the baby with the breast. So the, the biggest thing that causes problems is the initial, like if we don't initially get stimulating the breasts right away, the body gets confused, right? If the baby is born and there's no baby nursing, the body starts to go, I, that's odd. We don't have a baby here. I'm not going to spend time, energy, and effort making milk because there's no one, there's no milk that's being removed. So if we can, as babies are born, have them on the breast very, 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 very frequently nursing all the time, moving little bits of milk, we tell the body, yep, we still have a baby to feed and we need to feed here at the breast. So size does not matter. Storage capacity capacity can change based on size, but size does not matter. Nipples do not matter. Sometimes women who have very, very, very flat nipples, we will use a little 
techniques to help or maybe a nipple shield at first to help draw the nipple out but all that is is just tendons that are tight around the nipple and a lot of times those can loosen and it's not a big deal and babies can nurse on any nipple a baby can nurse on a large nipple on a small nipple on a flat nipple <laughs> babies don't care they want to eat they want to be close to their mom and they can adjust and they can adapt um i will say because i'm sure we'll have some comments about this i will say there are a small percentage of women who have what's called insufficient glandular tissue. A two to 5% of the population, depending on what population you're looking at, have what's called insufficient glandular tissue. And that's where the actual milk making tissue in the mom doesn't develop. And that's when she herself with 17 weeks gestation in her mom's belly, there was a difference in her development and the glandular tissue did not develop. So there's a small, small percentage of women who physiologically will not be able to make enough milk for their babies. Now, what's interesting about this is that we should be looking for these women prenatally, I believe. We should be assessing breasts. We should be asking questions because there are a whole bunch of signs that the, that you may have insufficient glandular tissue that show up in pregnancy. And so when a woman has, it's been caught early on that she may have insufficient glandular tissue, we can start looking at all the other things we can do to facilitate a breastfeeding relationship and still get little bits of milk to her baby while also figuring out our, our backup plan. Are we going to talk to other moms about donating breast milk? Are we, what, what is our backup plan? What are we actually going to do to feed this baby and facilitate a breastfeeding relationship? Because it is possible to have insufficient glandular tissue and still have a breastfeeding relationship to still be giving babies little bits of milk. Maybe it's only an ounce you can make every day. Did you know that ounce is power packed full of antibodies? It's like giving your baby a little immunization every single time you nurse, even if it's a tiny bit of milk. So there are whole communities of women online who have insufficient glandular tissue who are giving their babies tiny bits of milk that they can and finding other ways to supplement the rest of the nutrition that their child needs. But that's a really traumatic thing to walk through when you have no idea that it could happen. And then you here you are trying to breastfeed your baby and you don't seem to be making enough milk and you're trying to seek help and your baby's not gaining weight, all these things. So I there is a small percentage of women who do physiologically struggle to make milk. And we want to support those women. We want to connect them with women who have too much milk that can donate to them. We want to make sure that they feel like they have a plan in place and that they understand the benefit of still latching their baby, the emotional benefit, the physiological benefits of that little bit of milk that's going through and realizing that in that situation, you can be the pacifier. Like you can feed your baby a bottle if you need to with formula to feed your baby, to keep them, you know, getting nutrition in and still latch your baby, still have that connection, still have that bonding, still give the antibodies, still give the micronutrients that come through the milk, still have that incredible breastfeeding relationship um, and you be the pacifier. And so we've had women who have chosen to do that as well. So um, let's see, what were the other, you said you'd asked about size, um, a lot mastitis. of times mastitis, mastitis. So and that is you a, know, not uh, getting enough sleep yeah. at night, you know, all the excuses. Oh, yes. All the excuses. Well, so uh, yeah, let's jump to sleep really quick. So the biggest myth out there and the biggest thing we are culturally told to believe is that your baby needs to sleep away from you in a crib on their own. And um, it's it's just not, It's it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, my first question to you would be, do you sleep by yourself? Because most adult people don't. <laughs> most adult people that are having a baby have a spouse in bed with them. And I would ask you, do you feel safer when your spouse is in bed with you? I know when my husband used to work nights and he was gone all night long, I didn't sleep as well. I didn't feel as safe. I'm a grown woman and I have a lock on my front door and I am safe but I didn't feel as safe because the person who protects me and who cares for our family was not there. And so how, as an adult person, almost 40, am I going to expect that my tiny baby would feel safe away from their care provider, away from the person who has grown them inside. Um, so sleep's a whole, I mean, we could do an entire podcast on sleep, but I think understanding that children biologically are intended to be with their parents, that that is how they regulate their respirations, their temperature. They need to be fed frequently. Babies should wake every couple of hours at night. It's protective against SIDS that when you sleep close to your baby, your sleep cycle sinks so that you actually sleep and, um, 
nurse in light sleep and then drop to deep sleep together. And it's actually excessively safe. If you are an exclusively breastfeeding mom with an exclusively breastfeeding baby, you are safer together in bed than you are apart. And you're going to facilitate a breastfeeding relationship much better. And you're going to have much more success if you can sleep with your baby. One of my favorite resources is the La Leche League's book called Sweet Sleep. Sweet Sleep is a book that talks about the biology of what's actually happening, the research around sleep and babies. But to have a, a successful, wonderful breastfeeding relationship where you're getting enough sleep, you have to sleep with your baby and find a way to do that safely and find a way to facilitate that. Because if you have to get up every two hours to nurse your baby, you will wake up feeling like you've been hit by a truck and you will decide that breastfeeding is not the answer for me. I can't do this anymore. It's way too hard. I'm way too tired. And so that is one of the main things we help women with in our support group too, is helping them find a sleeping situation that feels safe and that will facilitate the breastfeeding relationship. Cause we know if they can't breastfeed at night, the breastfeeding relationship will fall apart. And um, we have to be able to find a safe way to sleep together and feed while we're resting, while we're sleeping. Um, and then when it comes to something like mastitis, so mastitis is an infection in the breasts that basically means milk's not moving, it, it's sitting. So milk, milk curdles, just like every other milk. <laughs> and our milk, if it sits in our breast for too long, will curdle and we'll make a little clog. And that's called a clogged milk duct. And that little clog basically gets stuck and then the milk continues to be made behind it and it can be really, really sore. And uh, we have to move those clogs out. If we don't move that clog out, it sits, it becomes infected, that becomes mastitis. Now, sometimes a woman might get mastitis. You feel cold and flu symptoms, often have a fever. Your breast is usually very, very, very tender with a red spot that really hurts. And women will go to the ER, let's say, and be like, ah, something's going on. And I've had so many situations where a woman calls me after her trip to the ER and the doctor told her, you have to stop breastfeeding on that breast. You're going to pass that infection to your baby. Here's antibiotics. You can't breastfeed while you're on your antibiotics. You need to pump and dump all your milk. And I'm like, oh gosh, oh gosh, that's literally all the opposite worst advice you could have gotten. Mm. <laughs> the solution to mastitis is nursing the baby. This is not an infection you can pass to your child. We don't have to worry about making them sick from your mastitis. The baby is the solution. Nursing is the solution. Moving milk is the solution. Antibiotics are completely safe. You can take antibiotics and breastfeed your baby. It's 100% safe because guess what? If your baby was sick, what would we give them? Antibiotics. <laughs> so if they can take antibiotics, if they're sick, we can take them. Well, while we're breastfeeding. So um, mastitis is one of those things that we hope women don't go through. But if you it really starts with a clogged milk duct and the milk duct getting clogged usually starts with moms not nursing frequently enough or introducing a pacifier too soon. So they're giving a pacifier, their baby's nursing on or sucking on a pacifier instead of on them and their milk ends up not moving as frequently as it should. So um, no pacifiers for the first six weeks, no pumping and bottles for the first six weeks, just establishing breastfeeding relationship. Mom and baby is one of the best ways you can avoid clog ducts and avoid mastitis. Um, but yeah, it's all based on not nursing really frequently enough. And so the solution is to nurse more frequently and to milk, uh, help that milk get moving. I don't know if Natalie, the you <laughs> em encompass the title of this podcast, No Better <laughs> So You Can Do Better, essentially. And you have taught us so much today. And there's so many other things that you've said that it's like, oh, oh, it, it's, it could be its own <laughs> podcast. So we'll have to have you back. Where can people yes. find you? You know, is there a way for them to get into your uh, nursing support group online? Um, where can they find you? Are you on social media? Yeah, absolutely. I am on Facebook and Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle is standing so tall, um, standing underscore so underscore tall. It's something we didn't talk about in this podcast, but I'm six one. I'm very tall. So when you meet me in person, you're like, oh, you are really tall. <laughs> so <laughs> standing so tall is my Instagram handle. In that, um, in my description, you'll see the community carriage house, and that is my breastfeeding support group um, Instagram. And in the community carriage house, on the stories, I always post when we are having our Zoom group. We do a Zoom support group every single week and you can just jump on zoom moms ask questions my best friend and i answer them and we uh, facilitate a lot of discussion in that once a week zoom group if you are in southern california and you want to come in person every week we have an in-person support group that happens in redlands um redlands california so if you are close by we'd love to have you and you can just reach out to me either once again on facebook um natalie johnson my maiden name was melcher so it's a little bit easier to find me with natalie melcher and then on Instagram understanding so tall, but I would love to support you on your journey. You can always private message me either of those places. 
And I obviously follow her. So if you happen to follow me, you can find her real easy. Yes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, Natalie, I cannot thank you enough for your mission to be able to help moms. You are so needed. And I know that so many people are going to value this podcast and uh, definitely share it. Um, I hope you'll go plug in to what Natalie has to offer. And uh, Natalie, I hope you'll be back to share more. Yes. Oh, gosh. Just tell me when. I can't wait. <laughs> It'll be fun. All right. We will definitely do that. Once again, thanks for being here. And um, kudos to, uh, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, thanks again for being here. And um, go take this information, share it, empower other moms. And uh, we will see you on the next episode. Have a great day, guys.